Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Noam Chomsky. Noam, thank you for joining me today. Glad to be with you. You have been warning that Trump and the people around him pose a unique threat to humanity. On this front, you've gotten a lot of attention for your warnings about Trump's policies on climate change. I want to focus today on other aspects of your warnings that have not gotten as much attention, starting with nuclear weapons, an issue that you've been involved with your whole life. Trump has greatly exacerbated the threat, pulling out of the INF Treaty with Russia, pulling out of the Open Skies Treaty, and now looking like he will sabotage the New START Treaty, the last remaining accord that limits the nuclear weapon stockpiles of the US and Russia. As we are speaking, Russia has said that there's no chance of an agreement uh, between the US and Russia before the election, which leaves a very short window to renew New START before it expires in February. Your thoughts on the Trump administration's nuclear policy and what it would mean if it manages to kill the New START Treaty? Well, the New START Treaty will be the last of the remaining treaties on arms control that uh, Trump has, uh, actually George W. Bush eliminated the first one, the uh, uh, ABM treaty. Uh, but but uh, Trump, ever since he's come into office, has uh, systematically destroyed one after the other. The INF treaty, which goes back to Reagan Gorbachev, the uh, Open Skies Treaty actually was initiated by Eisenhower. Uh, he's threatened to carry out new nuclear tests. That hasn't been done for almost 30 years. Uh, the new start is the last one. The United, it's, as you said, it's due to be uh, uh, renewed in February. Uh, the Trump administration has been delaying and delaying and delaying. The Russians have been uh, pleading for uh, negotiations to renew it. Uh, the, the Washington's been producing very frivolous objections. Finally, at the last minute, Billing, see their negotiator claims, okay, I finally reached an agreement. Uh, we believe that uh, there is an agreement in principle uh, at the highest levels of our two governments. Uh, it's why I cut short uh, my trip to Asia and, uh, and made a beeline for Helsinki uh, when the Russians called and wanted to sit down. And I'm hopeful that uh, that sort of gentleman's agreement, that arrangement that uh, we feel has been reached, as I've said, at the highest levels, uh, will ultimately need to percolate down through their system uh, so that my counterpart, hopefully, uh, will be authorized to uh, negotiate. Nobody knows what it is. It seems to require that Russia make certain concessions with the U.S. making no concessions. One of the crucial issues for Russia is the fact that we have ABM installations on their border. Now, ABM installations can readily be modified, even with nobody knowing anything about it, to be first strike weapons. If they had those weapons on our border, we'd blow them up, wouldn't tolerate it for a moment. This actually goes back to Obama. So if there is to be any renegotiation, they would certainly have to include that. Whatever the Trump administration is proposing seems is just calling for the Russians to give up something. But the point is, it's the last minute. Negotiations take some time. There are issues. So the what the Russians are asking for now is, OK, let's just continue the treaty, period. Then we can get into negotiations. Apparently, Washington's refusing. A lot of this is going on pretty much in secret. We don't really know the details. That's what it looks like. What we do know is that the Trump administration has been delaying and delaying until it's probably too late to do something. Right now, you can guess what their strategy is. They want to ram something through before the election so they can claim, look how wonderful we are. It's worth remembering that there's a kind of a principle behind Trump's behavior. 
which is virtually universal. If there is any treaty or international arrangement that I didn't create, it's the worst one in the world. We have to destroy it. Uh, if I can reach some arrangement, even it's maybe the same as before, uh, maybe it's ludicrous like the uh, Middle East one, but then it's the greatest deal in history. That's the principle. And the arms control regime has fallen under that, uh, just as the uh, Paris negotiations on climate did the uh, uh, Iran sanctions ag agreement, uh, the Iran JCPOA, the interim ag the agreement on Iran nuclear weapons. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Trump pulled out of COVAX, the international consortium that's working on uh, cooperate, uh, cooperation in developing a vaccine, obviously the best way and dealing with the distributional problems of ensuring that those who need it will get a, an eventual vaccine or vaccines instead of it being monopolized by the rich and powerful. So Trump pulled out of that. Uh, right now at this moment, it's not getting any coverage. There's a very important uh, international conference going on, UN conference on biodiversity, which is extremely important. We're in the midst of the sixth extinction. Species are disappearing at a incredible rate. Uh, even if you're just looking at the single prospect of very likely prospect of a new pandemic worse than this one, biodiversity is crucial for dealing with it. Everybody's attending, Trump won't attend. Uh, doesn't matter. Any international agreement, treaty, whatever, that he didn't create has to go, period. Okay, that's new start is falling under that. Uh, actually, it goes beyond just destroying the arms control regime. So you may recall a, a year ago when uh, Trump dismantled the INF agreement, the Reagan-Gorbachev agreement, immediately, within days, uh, the US launched new weapons violating the treaty. That's telling the Russians and everyone else, it's gone. We're not only rescinding it, we're gonna violate it. You do the same. So you create weapons to destroy us just as we'll create weapons to destroy you. And the background is of course, the great Trump increase in developing weapons of mass destruction, new, more dangerous ones, what they call tactical nuclear weapons. No, no enemy knows what's on them. They could be first strike strategic weapons, very destabilizing and dangerous. Uh, uh, hypersonic missiles, uh, a new space uh, uh, military system, uh, breaking, effectively breaking the uh, space treaty that tries to neutralize, keep space neutral. So in general, and I should add that this goes along with highly provocative military maneuvers on the Russian border, and now sending virtually the whole Pacific fleet into the South China Sea, a point of high tension we're clearly in negotiations and diplomacy are in order, not waving your fist at a, a potential enemy which could, and carrying out actions which in fact just by accident could break out into an incident which would escalate. Uh, all of this is going on, greatly increasing the threat of nuclear war. Uh, specialists on the uh, people who are acquainted with the topic, who know the history, which is quite a history incidentally, shows that it's a virtual miracle that we've escaped this far. People cognizant of that, people who've been immersed in these issues for years are very concerned. You can see it in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, so you can see it in perhaps most strikingly with William Perry, sober, not given to exaggeration, spent all his life uh, at the top of the government working on nuclear issues, former defense secretary, 
Uh, he's now a recent book, uh, Touring the Country. His message is that he's not only terrified, but doubly terrified. Terrified because the threat is greater than it was during the Cold War, in his estimate, and doubly terrified because nobody's paying any attention to it. If you look at the two um, coronations, you know, the conference, the, uh, uh, the conventions, I, I, I doubt if it was even mentioned. I couldn't see a mention of it. Even global warming was barely mentioned, uh, but this was not. So yes, it's extremely serious. We may be heading to a point of really no return. If this, there are many possibilities around the world where a nuclear war could break out, which incidentally is related to Iran. So Trump's uh, actions on Iran uh, first uh, uh, eliminating the uh, JCPOA, the joint agreement that was uh, settled. Notice, incidentally, this violates international law. That was an agreement uh, authorized by the United Nations Security Council. Trump says, fine, I don't want it. Somebody else created it, it's out. Uh, that, of course, increases tensions. It, leads predictably to Iran's pretty, so far, pretty mild reactions, but they could extend the murder of Soleimani, which is greatly praised in the United States, is an extraordinarily dangerous act. Nothing like that happened during the Second World War or during the Cold War. It's as if uh, uh, Iran had uh, decided to murder Mike Pompeo and uh, a major uh, a general along with him uh, at the Mexico City International Airport. We think that's pretty serious. That's what the murder of Soleimani was. Soleimani was. Incidentally, it's praised here, which is pretty astonishing. Shows how extreme the internal assumption is that the United States is a rogue state which has nothing to do with international law or obligations. We do what we like. It's accepted pretty much across the board. But actions like that, and further actions, are increasing tensions. Some incident in the Gulf, even by accident, it could blow up, could lead to an Iranian reaction, which in turn could lead to a US-Israeli bombing of Iran. Israel's just itching to do it. It's been hoping to be unleashed for a long time. Now that could lead to Iran's immediate destruction of the world's major energy reserves. It's not an exaggeration. They happen to be in northeast Saudi Arabia, right on the Iranian border. Iran already demonstrated with Houthi attacks, that it has the capability to do that. Suppose they do it. Suppose that Hezbollah rockets start uh, bombings, attacking uh, Tel Aviv and Haifa. Israel reacts with a nuclear attack. The US reacts with a nuclear attack. You're off and running. There are possibilities like that. This is one of the worst, but there are others. So yes, we're facing an extremely dangerous situation. And I think William Perry is right at being doubly terrified, both by the increasing threat and the failure to pay any attention to it. I have a lot of follow-ups, including about Iran, where Trump has recently imposed more sanctions that further cut Iran off from the financial system, which will only punish Iranian civilians. But on the nuclear weapons front, You've had this going on for a while. You mentioned Marshall Billingsley, the U.S. arms control envoy. He's talked about spending our adversaries into oblivion. The president's made clear that we uh, have a tried and true practice here. We know how to win these races and we know how to spend the adversary into uh, into into oblivion. Uh, if we have to, we will. But uh, we sure would like to avoid it. 
a series of treaties have been killed. But yet, as you say, this has gotten almost no attention. And meanwhile, Democrat Trump's opposition, the Democrats, have been wedded to this narrative that Trump is actually doing Russia's bidding, is in cahoots with Putin, which I think has incentivized them to ignore all the hawkish things he's doing, even if that means uh, exacerbating the threat of nuclear peril. What do you make of the fact that Trump's nuclear policy has gotten very little attention? It's almost unimaginable. Uh, almost everybody with any familiarity with these issues is deeply concerned. I mean, take, say, the Doomsday Clock Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Every January, they set the uh, clock to give some kind of assessment of the world security situation. One of the top issues for them is nuclear war, of course. It has been back to 1947. Uh, every year that Trump has been in office, the minute hand has been moved closer to midnight, meaning termination for all of us. Uh, two years ago, it reached the closest point it had ever reached since 1947. This last January, the analysts gave up minutes altogether. They moved to seconds. So no more minute hands. Now it's the second hand, 100 seconds to midnight. One of the major concerns, not the only one, is the increasing threat of nuclear war, which Trump has magnified since then by breaking the open start, start treaty, threatening nuclear weapons attack, and now probably killing a new start. Uh, so the, the lack of attention to this, and the Democrats are deeply culpable, I should say, as you said, uh, is just shocking. We very recall that it was not always like this. So in the early 80s, uh, the largest mobilization in American history took place uh, to uh, 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 opposing the enormous threat of nuclear weapons. It's not that long ago that had a consequences is one of the factors that led Reagan to agree with Gorbachev on the INF Treaty. It was the immediate background for Reagan's development of these uh, SDI, so-called Star Wars fantasies, to try to dampen down protests, which unfortunately it did. Uh, but it was a huge opposition. A uh, million people in the streets of New York. What's happened since? Just illusions that somehow, if the Cold War is over, it doesn't matter. It matters very much, greatly. And trying to break through on this is pretty, it's pretty, I, I just don't know how to proceed on it. So it goes beyond this, incidentally. Now take a look at the New York Times this morning. There's an editorial uh, saying we shouldn't uh, torture Iranians, sort of mixed editorial, but at least it's there. Read down to the bottom, right below the editorial, there's a questionnaire which asks people uh, to list their reasons for voting in November. What's your top reason for voting? And look at the choices. Uh, hurricane, uh, businesses put out of business, all immediate local things. Not only nothing about nuclear weapons, nothing about destroying the environment the two major topics that humanity not only faces now, but has ever faced in its history, and especially on, actually on both, but especially on global warming, a case where the Trump administration is simply driving to catastrophe. But that's not one of the choices you're supposed to pick as to why to vote. It's as if the Elites are mesmerized, can't think, you know, hard to know how to break through on this. You mentioned how the Reagan administration was compelled by public pressure to embrace some arms control treaties. 
And I believe this speaks to a point that you've made that the Trump administration is an aberration on this front, that you don't think that any popular pressure could make any difference with them because they're so beholden to their very narrow constituency. Is that a fair reading on on why you think one of the many reasons why you think we should vote to defeat Trump in November? That's one strong reason. Uh, whatever you think about the Democrats, uh, not much in my opinion, but whatever you think about them, they are amenable to pressure. Now, just as Reagan was, now, just as Nixon was, we're dealing with a very different situation now. If you see it very clearly in the uh, repeated statements by Trump, backed by his, what used to be a political party, hate to call it that now, uh, that he might not leave office if he doesn't like the outcome of the election. I just compare that with predecessors. Now take Richard Nixon, not the most delightful figure ever to have been in office. In 1960, Nixon had fair reason to believe that the election might have been stolen by Democratic Party machinations in urban centers, mainly Chicago. He didn't challenge it. Nixon put the welfare of the country above his personal ambitions. Al Gore did the same when the election was stolen by the Supreme Court in 2000. The idea that Trump would put the welfare of the country above his personal ambitions is just too ludicrous to discuss. We're just in a different world. And in this different world, yes, I think Trump and the organize, political organization he has in his pocket are not amenable to public pressure. He has two constituencies. One is the traditional Republican constituency of extreme wealth and corporate power. He's got to keep them happy. Now, the other is the voting constituency, which has the Republican Party terrified. They're afraid to lift a finger because he'll launch his uh, adoring masses against them. That's a serious matter. This is a new situation in the history of parliamentary politics. Very different. We have to get rid of this malignancy or we're in deep, deep trouble. Okay, then with the Biden and the Democrats, they are susceptible to pressure. We've already seen that. In fact, the Biden program, I don't love it, but it's been pressed well to the left by popular pressure beyond predecessors, in fact. They are susceptible, whether they like it or not. Uh, that's one of many crucial differences. I think one thing that's been misunderstood about your advocacy for voting to defeat Trump, so in this case, electing Biden, is that you aren't saying that it ends there. And in fact, you've always said this, that we should vote to defeat the worst candidate going back uh, many elections. I remember when Barack Obama was on the ballot, you said that we should elect Obama, but without illusions. So in other words, put him in office, but then keep the pressure on him, which of course did not happen. He dismantled his grassroots campaign and a lot of us got complacent and went home. Do you think that this time now, though, with the Bernie Sanders movement awakened, with there being widespread distrust of the establishment and we're dealing with a pandemic, do you think that things are different now than they were under Obama when everybody sort of packed it in after he won? Well, I hope so. Actually, I've never, I've often myself just not bothered to vote when it didn't matter or voted for a third party if it didn't matter. Uh, this time is unusual. It matters a lot. In fact, more than anything ever, it, literally. So I therefore think there should, it shouldn't take five seconds for people to recognize we have to vote against Trump. Now, there's only one way to vote against Trump in our two-party system. That's to push the lever for the Democrats. That's voting against Trump. If you decide not to vote against Trump, 
you're helping him. You're helping him win. We can debate lots of things, but not arithmetic. If you withdraw a vote from Biden, that puts Trump one vote ahead. So you have essentially two choices on November 3rd. Am I going to vote against Trump or am I going to help him win? I can't imagine how there can be a discussion about that among rational people. Then, if you can manage to get him out, which is by no means obvious, then put the pressure on, continue the pressure, which Sanders and the popular movements have actually been doing to ensure that not only that they keep their campaign promises, but they go far beyond. That's, as you say, what was omit missing when Obama came in. Obama was very successful in marketing his fakery, I would say, his image. Uh, I'm sure you recall that uh, in 2008, uh, Obama won an award from the uh, Professional Association of Advertisers for the best advertising campaign of the year. And they said, yeah, we've got to pick up his techniques and use them to sell other things. They weren't fooled. They saw it as a marketing campaign, which was very successful. And unfortunately, it was successful even in the activist community. They did not go on to keep his feet to the fire, make him do something. Well, we saw what happened. That shouldn't, if you can get rid of Trump this time, that shouldn't happen. I think Bernie Sanders has had the right position on this. Engage in the campaign to press them to the left, which has been done to an extent, not as much as I'd like, but to an extent. Then if they're in, keep the pressure on without stopping because otherwise nothing will happen. Otherwise it'll move back towards the Clintonite DNC donor oriented center. And fortunately, I think this is a wonderful thing. Joe Biden doesn't have the, the political skills and charm that Obama did in being able to neutralize people, which then raises the prospects of there being an effective, you know, grassroots movement that could put pressure on him and, and uh, impact policy. But let me ask you about Iran. Um, if Trump manages to win and these sanctions continue, new sanctions have just been imposed, make it even more difficult for Iran to access humanitarian goods, cut off Iranian banks from the financial system. If Trump stays in power um, and there's no Biden, which means no Biden means no return to the Iran nuclear deal, which would be likely under him. If Trump stays in office, what are Iran's options? First of all, we should take a minute to recognize what just happened, which is something that I think has no precedent in the history of the United Nations. Remember what happened. The Trump administration went to the Security Council and requested that the Security Council extend UN sanctions against Iran. Actually, I don't think those sanctions were appropriate, but let's put that aside. US went to the Security Council, said, we would like you to renew the sanctions. Security Council refused totally. Every single US ally said no. Next step, Pompeo went to the Security Council and said, tough luck, children. It's reinstated because we say so. Get lost. We said it's reinstated. It's reinstated, period. See, you didn't find a precedent for that. I can't. Try to find one. What's more, it passed over virtually without comment. Try to find one. Again, I couldn't. It's an astonishing comment, not only about the administration and their sort of proto-fascist mentality, but also about the about elite opinion, just watching this and not saying anything. And of course, when the US imposes sanctions, that means everyone has to adhere to them. 
what's called third party sanctions. Europe doesn't like it. Other countries don't like it, but they're not going to uh, step on the toes of the godfather. It's too dangerous. It's a rogue, rogue elephant raging out there. You can't do anything about it. We can, they can't. Uh, the United States can simply throw them out of the international financial system. So they'll obey, they, they don't like it. That's the thinking. Interesting world that we're creating, okay? Well, what are Iran's options? Not much. They have to, they'll surely, first of all, it strengthens the hardliners in Iran. That's perfectly obvious, undermines the critical opposition. Uh, they'll have to react in some way or other. A reaction on their part might blow up in the manner that I described before. But there's something else that we ought to bear in mind about Iran and the Iran the whole Iran affair, this goes back to Obama and before, in fact. Let's imagine for a moment that the threat of Iranian nuclear weapons is serious. I don't think so. I don't think you think so. But let's accept for the sake of argument that there's a serious threat of Iran developing nuclear weapons. Is there a way to deal with it? Without sanctions, without threats, without murdering Iranian scientists, without uh, cyber war to destroy their facilities, which is an act of war. Yeah, a very simple way. And everyone in the diplomatic world knows it. And there's a conference about it coming up at the UN yes. next month. It's Institute a Nuclear Weapons Free Zone in the Middle East. How hard is that? The Arab states are strongly in favor of it. They initiated that appeal 25 years ago. They're even threatening to break out of the NPT if that isn't installed. They're in favor. What about Iran? Strongly in favor of it. It's been calling for it for years. Okay, that's Iran. Now, how about the Global South, the G77? The, uh, the non-aligned movement. 130 countries, strongly in favor of it, been calling for it for years. The Europe's in favor of it. In fact, you can't think of almost anybody who objects to it except two countries. One is Israel, which doesn't want its nuclear weapon system inspected. And the second is the godfather, the United States, blocks it at every turn. Most recently, Obama came up in 2015 at the uh, NPT review sessions where it always does. Obama mixed it, can't do it. We can, and if you think what's behind this, something very significant. Uh, if the, U, the US does not acknowledge that Israel has nuclear weapons, of course, everyone knows it does, it's not even, you can't even call it an open secret because it's totally open. But the US does not acknowledge it. If there's a nuclear weapons free zone, the US will have to acknowledge it. Israeli nuclear weapons get inspected. That brings up other issues, such as the United States law, Symington Amendment, for example, which bars aid military, even economic aid to countries that have produced nuclear weapons outside the NPT framework. Uh, nobody, the Democrats don't want to open that spigot. That, they don't want to say, let's look at that. You could argue the legalism, but even opening that question indicates what I think has always been true, that US aid to Israel is illegal under US law. Okay, no other considerations. U.S. law. Well, that's uh, something that uh, elites don't want to open up. So therefore, we threaten the world with nuclear war. We torture Iran, uh, killing who knows how many people. We raise the threat, the serious threat of tensions and uh, major threat in the Middle East all in order to protect U.S. aid to Israel. 
That's what it comes down to. This is one of those things you just can't talk about in the United States. Okay, try. I mean, I've been trying for years. You, you talk to an audience, they understand it in 10 minutes, but try to put it in the public domain. It's one of those unspeakable things. It's uh, what Orwell called uh, the kind of thing that you're trained in the top educational institutions, you're trained that it wouldn't do to say that's the ultimate in censorship. When you have inculcated into you the Orwellian doctrine that it wouldn't do to say certain things. That's his criticism of what he called literary censorship in England. You go to Oxford and Cambridge, you understand the mores, you know that there are things it wouldn't do to say. Well, here's one in the United States. Orwell was talking about thought control in free societies. We should talk about that too. This is one striking example of it. Well, speaking of which, let me ask you about another a related bipartisan establishment talking point when it comes to Iran, which is that it's taken for granted that Iran exhibits malign behavior and that we have to confront Iran's malign behavior. What do U.S. elites really mean when they say that? What they mean is same as Cuba's malign behavior. That's uh, what the State Department back in the early 60s, in the case of Cuba, called the threat of Castro. Threat of Castro, they said, is his successful defiance, their phrase, successful defiance of US policies going back 150 years. That is back to the Monroe Doctrine, when the US proclaimed that it had the intention of dominating the hemisphere. Couldn't do it at that time. The British were too strong. They were the main enemy. But the great strategic analysts, John Quincy Adams, uh, recognized that over time, uh, British power would decline, US power would increase, and we would be able to establish the Monroe Doctrine. But in 1959, Cuba became independent and made it clear it was not going to uh, accept US domination. It was going to carry out successful defiance of US demands. Okay, therefore, Kennedy launched an invasion, major terrorist war, uh, destructive murder sanctions, which continue until the present. Successful defiance is not acceptable. Your nearby mafia don will explain that to you. Uh, suppose some small grocery, uh, grocery store somewhere says, I'm not going to pay the protection money. Well, as far as the don is concerned, it's a rounding error in his, uh, in his finances. He doesn't even notice it. But you, he does notice it. He sends in his goons to smash him up because you can't tolerate successful defiance. Tolerate it in one place, it'll spread. It's been a, le it's a leading principle of international affairs, United States predecessors. Let's go to Iran. There, since 1979, they've engaged in successful defiance of US policies in the Middle East. US reacted at once, right after the overthrow of the Shah, one of the bases of US power in the region. Uh, the US strongly supported Iraq's Saddam Hussein's invasion of, Iraq, of Iran, murderous, brutal invasion, hundreds of thousands of people killed Iranians, chemical warfare, uh, chemical warfare even against Iraqis, Reagan administration supported it to the end, uh, even entered the war to ensure that Iran would have to capitulate. Then comes the next step, very harsh sanctions. And even worse, uh, President Bush took office after Reagan. Uh, one of the first things he did was to invite Iraqi 
nuclear engineers to the United States for advanced training in weapons production. That's right after the Iraqi invasion, which had devastated Iran. And then the harsh sanctions, then the rest of the story right up until today. And uh, when you talk about Iran's malign activities, they're not nice. No country's activities abroad are nice. Iran's aren't either. But they're acting like any power, trying to extend their influence in many ways. Uh, that cannot be tolerated, could be tolerated under the Shah, because he was our boy. So when the Shah invaded and conquered uh, Arab islands in the Gulf, the US said, that's fine, that's not malign, because you're our boy, we support you, you're the base for our power. But if you're carrying out successful defiance, then any activities you carry out are malign, and we can't tolerate that. Uh, then comes what we've just been discussed. So Noam, I know you have to go. So let me ask you finally about another issue that speaks to the US trying to silence defiance on the world stage. And that has to do with this uh, scandal unfolding at the OPCW. Last week at the UN Security Council, the US and its allies voted to block Jose Bustani, the OPCW's first director general, from speaking. Uh, he had come to testify in support of two OPCW inspectors who challenged a cover-up of their investigation in Syria. They found evidence that pointed to this attack, this alleged attack in Douma in April 2018 being staged on the ground, not carried out by the Syrian government. Their findings would have undermined the rationale for the U.S.-led bombing of Syria under Trump that same month. Their evidence was censored. So Bustani came to speak in support of them, but the U.S. and their al and their allies blocked them from speaking. You have previously signed a petition in support of these inspectors. Just with the few moments we have, I'm wondering your thoughts on why this story is important and why you think these inspectors should be heard. Well, what happened certainly arouses very severe suspicions. Uh, the OPCW came out with a report blaming Syria for a chemical attack. Uh, reporters like Robert Fisk and others thought it was pretty shady at the time, but didn't know. Then came the bombshell. Some of their leading investigators, top ones, came out and said that their own analyses undermined the OPCW reports and that they were being silenced. Okay. That asks the question, what then comes a long series of efforts to silence them up to what you just described. The United States and its allies want the uh, evidence provided by some of the top inspectors to be banned. We won't discuss it. We won't see if they're right or wrong. We'll just ban it. Well, tells a reasonable person something. They want to ensure that it's not discussed, meaning they're not, they have no confidence in their own conclusions, meaning the US bombing of Syria was undertaken on false pretenses. Okay, uh, that's got to be covered up. I think that's about whether their report is correct or not, I have no judgment. But what we do know is the United States and its allies don't want it discussed. They don't want the evidence discovered by the some of their top inspectors to be looked at. And the OPCW is capitulating to this, which is pretty shocking because they've been trusted on other things. If they're going to capitulate on this, why should they be trusted on anything else? And the irony, too, of them blocking Jose Bustani, who 18 years ago was ousted under pressure from the Bush administration because he stood in the way of the Iraq war. Exactly. It's more power, please. Pompeo has carried it to new heights than what he just carried off at the Security Council. But it's not new. You're right. It goes far back in U.S. policy. Noam Chomsky, I really appreciate your time as always. Thank you so much.